time you can peel it, it's just leaf after leaf. When you get to the center, there's nothing left. But the wonderful thing about an onion is it's the letters of its English name. An onion, it goes on and on with an I in the middle. <laughs> onion, on and on with an I in the middle. So, with the conditioned and the unconditioned, you let go of the condition more and more and more and more and more. Let go of all the, the, uh, f- the forms, the created things, till you go to the uncreated. Shh. Go into the middle of things. So every time you see the lotus petal, it is conditioned phenomena. Even the Buddha said the jhanas, they're not the unconditioned, but they're getting very close. All the petals are conditioned phenomena. When you peel them all off in the center, emptiness. Okay, when chanting the homage to the triple gem with closed eyes, I get into a sensation of into a space. Please advise if this is wrong. This is especially so when I focus at the nose while chanting. Amazing, the first Malaysian man or woman in space. <laughs> you don't need to go to NASA. You know how this space tourism these days? If you're a millionaire or a billionaire, they can shoot you up into space. You don't need to go to NASA and spend billions of dollars being a space tourist. You can save all the money. In fact, instead of giving the three or four million, however it costs, to NASA or to the Russians, you can give it to Chempaka Buddhist Lodge and I will send you into space. You can be the inner space tourist in Chimpaka Buddhist Lodge (laughs) for a very cheap price. All you need to do is to chant the triple gem and with inspiration, close your eyes, you get the sensation of space. Very good. This is not wrong, you're enjoying it. Great, well done. Next question. When I sit and bring my attention in front of me or within, I can feel and perceive the body erect and some chi sensation surrounding the body. The pain reduces. I tend to use this as a preparation before observing the Buddha. Is this correct? Yes, it's good. So, paying attention in front of me or within, you can perceive the body erect, some energy in the body, because when you let go, the energy starts to flow, the pain reduces, and it's a great way of preparing the body. That sounds good to me. Next question coming up soon. Dear Ajahn, in stage four, full sustained attention in the breath, quoted from your book, The Basic Method of Meditation, what do you mean when the first sensation of in-breathing arises? Could you kindly elaborate and give examples? Could you also kindly describe your way on stage four in details? When you let the breath disappear, do you purposely stop breathing at all? Lastly, when the breathing disappears, the mind is now taken... Now, taking the mind as its own object. <laughs> is this object the disembodied beauty? Yeah, it's quite simple. When you get more mindfulness of the breath, it's not just going in and going out. You start to, the breath starts to get more details. A simile I gave in the very beginning of this retreat is very helpful. If you go from the light outside into the dark, you know, late at night, you can't see anything at first. All you can see is shapes. Maybe you might know it's a pillar or a man, but you don't know which man it is. After a while, your eyes accustom itself to the darkness. You start to see more of what's out there. More details become apparent. So you can see which man it is, whether young or old, whether it's a monk or a lay person. The details soon fill out. In the same way, when you start watching the breath, all you can see in and out, that's all maybe. As the mindfulness gets brighter, you see more of the breath, you see more detail. It's not just in and out, it's the beginning of the in-breath, right to the very end. You see more, it is natural, it just happens all by itself. In the same way, when you were walking meditation, in, out, in, out, or sorry, not in, out, left, right, left, right, After a while, you start to see all the feelings of one foot moving. From the left foot moving from where it started to where it's finished, there's a whole flow of different sensations. You become more alert, more mindful, like when you're in the dark, you start to see more. It's a natural progression of growing power of your mindfulness. (laughs) As you start to see more, of the breath moving, in breath, out breath, 
you can actually notice just the very initial stages. Just when the in-breath starts. Just like the first stage when your foot lifts up. You can notice that. As the mindfulness gets stronger. What happens next is because the mindfulness gets stronger and more still, that breath going in and going out is just so beautiful after a while. It's accompanied by this feeling of joy. It's a beautiful breath. It happens quite naturally. It is your mindfulness getting strong. Whatever you see looks more beautiful. As I mentioned, with superpower mindfulness, even the, the flowers in front of me, they glow in their colors. They're not just ordinary yellows and whites. Incredibly powerful and deep colors. You're not adding that. You're, the color's not in the flower. You're <coughs> actually seeing it more fully because of your mindfulness. Sometimes it's like you're driving along the road and you realize your windscreen hasn't been washed for days. You can see things, but they're all dull. So you uh, clean your windscreen of your car and everything is just so sparkling in the sunshine outside. The windscreen of your car, being dirty, stands for the five hindrances. You've got five hindrances, you can only see dull shapes. When those five hindrances are taken away, what you see is sparkling and clear and energized. So this is what we do. We see more of the breath and it becomes more beautiful, more sparkling. It happens quite naturally that the breath disappears. It's not the breath doesn't stop. You're still breathing, but you're taking your attention away from it. You don't notice it anymore. Just like your heart is beating, but you don't notice it because it's not important anymore. Like the simile of the bird on the tree with the arches. The bird is still there, but you can only see the eye. The rest has disappeared. So you start with the, the full attention on the breath and then it becomes a beautiful breath. You don't do it purposely, it happens naturally. Just like the lotus opening up one leaf after another, you don't purposely get hold of those petals and pull them apart. You just keep warming the petals, as it were, with your mindfulness, still mindfulness, and it opens up by itself. A natural evolution of mindfulness. So when the breathing disappears, the mind does take the disembodied beauty, the brightness of the mind. Many people, many meditators recognize that as the mind becoming bright. Sometimes they see a black screen or a white screen, but it's very beautiful and peaceful. And from that white screen or that black, black screen, if you can only leave it alone, just like another layer of petals on the lotus, leave it alone. Just be mindful of that. Don't move the mindfulness. If you say, what should I do next? You actually like the sun moving on to another lotus and taking its heat away from the lotus you're on now. So that's why it goes wrong. Just stay put. Don't do anything. Be patient. And mindfulness will warm that black screen or that white screen and then a limiter will come out from the center. That's the way it works. Is that clear? Yeah? Okay, you're saying if the breath gets very refined, it disappears, should you find some object to focus on? No, you have the object to focus on. When the petals open up from a lotus, they reveal the petal which is inside. So when the breath disappears, what's left when the breath disappears, that's what you focus on. The point is that when the breath disappears, you're not used to that sensation, you can't recognize it, you're not familiar with it. So you, know, you can't grasp it that easily. We're used to only focusing on things which are solid, which we can grasp. And when I say, just what's left after the breath disappears, just focus on that. Ah, what am I supposed to do? It's the same that sometimes with new meditators, I say, let go of the past, let go of the future, focus on the present. They say, what the heck is that? What am I supposed, what am I supposed to do in present moment awareness? What am I supposed to watch? The present. Yeah, but what is it? It's what happens when the past and future disappears. Yeah, but give me something solid. The point is, because we're not familiar with these refined things to actually to focus on, it takes a while before, you know, I say, what's left when the future and the past disappear? And they keep asking that question until they become familiar with that experience called now. Once you become familiar with it, you know exactly what it is. Then the mind knows what to focus on. It becomes so wonderful. Even like silence, no, no thoughts. Some people, they never had I never noticed a moment when they weren't thinking about something. And so you do the, the space between the breaths. 
So the space between the thoughts, meditation. Because when one thought finished, another thought hasn't begun. You notice that. And you become familiar by what we mean by silence. And then after a while, when you know what we're talking about by silence, you can recognize it. You can actually allow it to grow. You can stay with it because you recognize it. It's some, a friend who you know all about. It's the same with what happens when the breath disappears. Allow that to be. Soon you become familiar with it. You know who it is. And then you can stay there as long as you like. But don't go anywhere else. The petal is opened. What you're looking at now may not be clear to you yet. Stay with it. It's just like another layer of darkness. You have to allow the eyes to accommodate to that darkness. And you'll see that what you thought was nothing there was actually a lot of beautiful things. <coughs> like when you go outside from a light room into a dark room. It takes a while to see what's there. First you think there's nothing. There is. Your mindfulness just has to grow that little bit, bit stronger to see what's there when the breath disappears. So don't do anything, just wait. The Ajahn, I have heard of spirits who re- repeat their deaths, e.g. suicides, and are forever caught in an endless cycle like the ghost who keeps on ringing the doorbell wanting to get in the house. Is there any way to help these spirits? Does transferring merits help? Was it the spirit's karma to repeat that endless cycle with Mega Meta? Okay, what happens? Everyone's going to put Mega Meta on there now, so I better change it to, after Mega Meta, Giga Meta. <laughs> That's actually the next stage up from Mega Bytes to Giga Bytes. So I'm going to start writing on my book now with Giga Meta. Giga Meta, sorry. And that we're going to change afterwards to Giggle, giggle Meta. <laughs> <laughs> to the Hahayana path. <laughs> so if anyone asks you, is Ajahn Brahma Hinayana Mark a Theravada Mark a Mahayana Mark? You can say Ajahn Brahma, he follows the Hahayana. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yes. So, you can actually change your habits. You change your habits through mindfulness. So somehow you've got to inspire that ghost actually to have uh, some bit of mindfulness so you can see exactly what it's doing. It doesn't repeat the same old habits. Which is why I've taught you, I'm not sure if you've done this yet, when you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth. Are you still brushing the teeth in the same corner of the mouth as you usually do? Don't be creatures of habit. You'll die. Don't always sit in the same place. Don't always do the same thing. Otherwise, you're just a robot. So... If you're a robot, you'll keep repeating the old bad habits. Just like those ghosts or those suicides. With mindfulness, you see exactly what you're doing. One of the other definitions of mindfulness, you've got many, many doors to come in, to go out from. If you're a creature of habit, you only see the well-worn path. You've always gone in that door. You always go out that door. You always eat the same breakfast. You always do the same things. You're a routine person. And sometimes you die. If you're a routine person, if you've committed suicide in your past life, when things get tough, you do the same thing again. A person of routine, you see the husband, you always say the same rotten things to him. Your wife, you always treat them the same way. You can't change the bad habits of life because it's automatic. You don't do it without thinking. However, when you have mindfulness, you have so many different opportunities. You can do things in a different way. You don't have to always... Repeat your past mistakes. So, develop a strong mindfulness and you'll find you'll be able to stop. Even if you're a ghost, you will not ring the doorbell more than once. You ring the doorbell, the mindfulness will come. What the heck am I doing that for? You don't have to ring the doorbell. You realize as a ghost, you can just walk straight through the door. (laughs) Much more fun. (laughs) It's just because of his old habit. The old habit was as a person who owned that house, he always had to have someone open the door to go through. That's why he wanted, he couldn't open the door himself, so he's trying to get someone else to open the door for him. Just a creature of habit. He's a ghost now, he doesn't need the door to be opened. He can just go right through. Perhaps we shouldn't tell him that, because the owners of the house will probably be very upset at me if I tell that ghost, ah, just go straight through, enjoy yourself. 
And they say with suicide, you don't have to solve the problem that way. In fact, you're not solving the problem. There's many other better ways to solve the problem. So, you have alternatives. Mindfulness gives you alternatives. Any question about that? If there is no self, why is there karma? There was once a monk, when the Buddha was teaching Anatta, said exactly the same. And the Buddha blasted him. He said, you think you can outstrip the teachings of the Buddha, you stupid monk. Now, be careful, because... There is karma on the stream of consciousness. The stream of consciousness has suffering, unhappiness, happiness as well in its process. Karma works on the stream of consciousness. It's cause and effect, that's all. So it's important that you make good karma in order for your stream of consciousness to be happy. Don't we say, may all sentient beings be happy and well? Your stream of consciousness is a sentient being. It's not a permanent self, but it is the being like life. Just as you wish loving kindness and happiness to all beings, you should wish it to your own stream of consciousness as well. Even Even though other people's consciousness aren't yours, you still wish them well. So you should always wish well to your stream of consciousness. Always make merit, even if you're an arahat, just out of compassion. If abortion is needed due to medical reasons, or is, is it true that bad karma generated could be reduced if forgiveness is sought before the abortion? Again, it's the, <coughs> it's the intention there is important. In that case, some years ago in England, I was visiting my mother in England, about, it must be about four years ago, I saw this in a newspaper that there was a woman in a hospital, I think she was in Wales somewhere, and she had uh, twins inside her womb because of some medical condition. If she uh, just went ahead with a natural birth, the two twins would certainly die and so would she. And the doctor was saying, well, if we abort one of those children, the other one would live and so would the, the mother. And so they had this ethical debate. Most of the evangelicals were going, no, leave it to God. And the doctor was saying, look, if we leave it to God, the whole three of them will die. There is God's will, okay, they'll die. But the other people said, no, look, it's better to save two people's lives, even if it means no killing one. Because inaction is killing them. And the doctor, actually, while this ethical debate was going on in the newspapers, and I got really interested to see exactly how it turned out, the doctor just went ahead and aborted one kid. So the mother and the other child could survive. That is not bad karma. It's the best they could do. Three, also, is it true that if someone has done an abortion, forgiveness, anguli, mala, he killed thousands of people could still become an arahat forgive, let go so it's not a huge thing people do many more bad things as I said a husband who goes and sleeps with another woman not his wife makes much worse karma than a woman who has an abortion I say so you men should be very feel very guilty not just a woman Anyway, three, also is it true that the consciousness in the fetus could be asked to return again in the subsequent pregnancy before the abortion? Yes, it can and it does. One of my disciples had their first child. Actually, it was the... It was the... Yeah, actually, it was the owner. No, it wasn't. It was their their sister. I think the owner of the, the house where the ghost is outside. It was that family's sister. When they, the wife was pregnant with the first child, they had an ultrasound just a couple of days before birth. Everything was fine. Then those couple of days, the baby turned the womb, strangled itself on the umbilical cord and came out stillborn. So close, but didn't quite make it. And I performed the funeral service for the baby. They called him Charlie, a <coughs> boy. And... As sometimes they do in Thailand, there were ties. While I wasn't looking, while the undertaker wasn't looking, they got out a biro pen and they put a mark, a line, on the heel of Charlie's little baby feet. And then, covered the coffin, was cremated. 
Soon, shortly afterwards, she became pregnant again. This time she took a lot of care and the pregnancy was successful. She gave birth to a little girl called Anne. 